Hey everybody, it's Joel from the Board Game Mechanics. Today I'm taking a look at Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. That's a little bit of a mouthful, but it comes to us from Stonemeyer and Bezier Games. Before I get into my thoughts on it, let's go to the table and take a look at how this kind of plays, how it comes together. Let me start with the box. I think you should look at this box. It's got great art on it. I think the style of the art of this game is one of the real strong points on it. It's just a really cool art style in this game. So Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Oh, there it goes. Um, so let's take a look, too. This is something that Stonemaier Games has been doing with their recent releases, which are these gamer trays. I don't know how much this costs, but if it's like a nominal cost to the game, which it, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this game was pretty affordable. It's a pretty good price point. My little side is a good price point. So, I mean, some of the games that have these gamer trays in there, it doesn't feel like they increase the price a ton, and it just makes the game so much quicker to get to the table, makes it so much better to play. So this one's got this tray. This tray is really well designed because you can stick fingers down in here and grab tiles real, real easily. Um, there's stacks of nine tiles in each of these little compartments, which does matter. Being able to grab nine tiles that are randomized quickly does absolutely matter. It also has storage for your, your, cat, uh, your throne rooms, which throne rooms are central to the game. Uh, so we'll get into that again here in a second. This this little tray here, I want to take a look at this one real fast as well. This is the one that I would leave on the table out in the middle of the play because you're going to be grabbing pieces out of here. As you get certain like unlocks or rewards as you're playing, you get to put these things out there. So um, this one's kind of important to just kind of keep out in the middle. The way how the game works uh, is that you're working together with a partner. So like where these these stacks are at with the little wooden with the wooden pawns on there are where you would basically be building. Those are where you'd be, let me pan up a little bit so you can see. So that's where people would be setting, are where those those three stacks are at. And then the castles they're building are on both sides of them. So one player, these two players would be building this castle. These two players would be building this castle. Uh, these two would be building that one. I mean, so that's kind of a neat thing that you're working together with the people on your right and your left to try and make a really good castle. The thing that makes the game really unique and really cool is that you score your worst scoring castle. So if I scored, let's say this castle scored 58 points and that one scored 54 points, I'd get the 54 point castle. I don't, the 58 point castle doesn't matter. So I want both of my partners to do well, which is kind of a neat mechanism in there. Um, the other really cool thing about this game, uh, so that's like, that's like roughly how you win. I'm, I'm, let me back up here before I talk about cool things about this game. Um, when you play the game, how you do it, is you have a stack of nine tiles to start with, and then you're going to look through these tiles. Let's see if I can get this to focus on this. Yeah, there we go. So I have these tiles to pick from, and this one's, you know, a pile that's already been picked through a little bit. Um, actually, this would be an illegal stack because there's six tiles left in here. So let's go ahead and put a seventh in there. Um, this would be like this would be like we've drafted once, and there's seven tiles left. I'd pick from these tiles and then place them. So this is where the mechanic of the cooperative building and the doing stuff in the margins of the players is kind of cool. It borrows that from Between Two Cities. But then this is kind of where I think we get more of the Mad King, Castles of Mad King Ludwig kind of thing going on with it, which I really do enjoy that game as well. It has, it has you know, these neat little rooms, but then they have different ways they score and they how, how they interact with each other. So there's no odd shapes. Everything's a rectangle. Placement of the tiles is much more simple in this game than in Castles of Mad King Ludwig, but there's more complexity in how you draft them together. Um, it's just a really cool drafting game. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm a pretty big drafting fan. And I think this one's probably among the better drafting games that I've played, just because it's got that cool, like, the collaboration thing really is cool. But then these tiles are really cool, too. So I'm just going to look through these real quick here. Let you just see that the art on these are amazing. I mean, all these rooms, I think every room is almost unique. I don't think I've seen really doubles yet. I mean, look at that, the repair shop. I mean, like that, the art on that, somebody spent hours doing that art, you know? I mean, for one tile in this game key room so um let's talk more about these tiles now and this will give you a chance to look at some more art there are several different types of tiles so this tile right here this is a corridor so i know that because it has this symbol here in the corner and i'll talk about what these different rooms do a little bit later but corridors are that gray symbol there um and then it also has a wall hanging kind of indicator there so this has that oval symbol there which i think means there's probably like mirrors in there if i had to if i had to, i haven't read what exactly it is but I think it's mirrors. And then this one also scores one star, which are points, per each each mirror type symbol that is adjacent to it all the way around. So that white square in the middle indicates that it's this tile, wherever those black squares are at, indicate the adjacency where you can score that. So for every tile that is connected to this, even diagonally, 
you score one point. So that's how this tile would generate points for you. Next, the padded room. Isn't that fun? Um, this one just says for the scoring on it, it says one point for every living corridor, corridor above it. And it's a downstairs room, which is indicated there. Has wall has torches on the wall as their wall hangings. Boy, focus is not very really happy with me. I'm gonna set it to a set focal point there. The schoolhouse, the schoolhouse there. Um, the schoolhouse is a really cool piece of art as well. I'm a teacher. I'm partial to this one, I guess. But it's a utility room, and it's one point for each connected corridor. So the idea of connection is basically the idea that as long as you could go like walk from room to room without having to walk into any other rooms. Or you could always cross a, a side and not have to go diagonal. All those rooms count. So you could have, you know, in theory, 10 of those connected to that. So that's kind of a cool way to score points in this. A French gazebo. This is an outdoor space. So outdoor spaces we'll talk about here in a minute. Some of the unique things about it. But it's an outdoor space. Scores one point per, per specialty building, I think is what that shield kind of means. Those are like the reward buildings that you get plus the throne room. The cutlery room. That's kind of cool. Look at all those knives and stuff. Um, the, all the cutlery in there. Uh, two points for every outdoor space on either side of it. So this one would be kind of tricky to build. You'd have to build this kind of at the top of your building um, in order to have outdoor spaces. Well, I guess not because you could build outdoor space in this room. It'd just be kind of its own standalone little building, I guess. The salon. This is a living quarters. And then this one had one sleeping spaces all around it. So you get one point for each sleeping space around it as it indicates there. Plus, it has the, the art type wall hangings there. It's a little bit different. So here's the, here's here are my favorite. The, the sleeping rooms, the nap room. Um, this These rooms are interesting because they want you to diversify your castle. So this one's going to score one point. But if you can get every type, it's going to score four. So you want to try and get every type if you have many of those. And we're back to corridors. So let's let's take a look here real quick at this player aid so you can get an idea of how these things get placed and how they score. Um or actually, I guess more of the bonuses they get. So, like, we have the types of cards over there. The arrows next to them, to the right-hand side, so right here, those indicate that, that um, those basically indicate how you can place those. So the arrow up means it must be above ground. The arrows down mean they could be above ground, or below ground. The corridors can be above or below. So downstairs rooms, obviously, only can be downstairs. Above ground rooms can be above ground. The corridors can do either. So then the other thing, too, is the bonus for three. That's something that's worth mentioning there, and I won't go through all those, but once you place your third of that type in the in the castle, you get that bonus. So you get to sometimes put an extra free room in, or you get to put another scoring modifier in your throne room, or a modifier card, or some of those special outdoor spaces that were that yellow tray that we mentioned earlier. So let's go down to the table here and take a look at a castle. I'm going to zoom in here. So there's that tray again. Let's pan down to this castle here. So this castle has some unique things about it, too, right off the bat. This one is uh, two points if you can get on either side of it a living space or a corridor. So our first round we played, we figured, hey, let's put a corridor there. My partner and I did. And then he picked this, you know, like, I don't know why he picked that one, but he picked it and he thought, you know what, it'll, good, it'll do well above there. So that was our first round. Then we picked more tiles later. So what kind of things might we be, might we be looking for? Well, we'd be looking for things with like wall sconces there that are going to burn. And then this one's going to be looking for living quarters next to it. So... I mean, it would make sense that we would put like a living quarter next to it right there because that's going to score points for us. And then it would make sense that we're going to try and put something with a, a wall sconce near it. So look, I, I can go underground on that one even. So I'm going to put my padded room there below, okay? So this is kind of a good chance for us to take talk about tile placement rules. When we look at this castle, we're getting a front view of it, not a bird's eye view. So that's the thing that is a little different than than in this game than uh, in Castles of Bad King Ludwig. Uh, the, the between two castles is you're looking at this castle from a bird's eye view. So you're looking at it from the front. This is the first story, second story underneath. So it's like you're playing Sim Tower or you're playing uh, uh, like one of those little iOS games where you run a tower. So there's there's a tower you're basically building, but you can build up and down as long as you follow the rules. The, the rule biggest rule for going above and, above and below are the, the indicators of where the rooms can be, underground or above ground. But the other piece that is worth mentioning too is that when you build an outdoor space, which you know outdoor spaces right away because they're they're outlined in blue, you may only build beside them or under them. They don't have a roof. So this tile placement right here would be illegal. Okay? You could, however, build over there, over here on top of this. It doesn't have to be adjacent to the whole main sector. 
Um, but I mean, some connectivity would probably be pretty smart. But at any rate, this castle is going to continue to grow. Uh, we can grow it either way. I'm going to pan over a little so you can see what I did there. So um, just a neat game. And I, I, like I said, I think every tile in this game is, is unique. Um, just really cool. Um, so, you know, I would, I would keep adding these tiles. Oh, I can't do that one. I just said I can't, right? Keep adding these tiles to this castle. And over the course of the game, it's going to become, you know, this, this big uh, castle. So um, let's go ahead and let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at the final thing we need to know. So this, <laughs> the scoring on this, I thought was going to be an absolute nightmare. I thought it was going to be just a total terror to, to score this game. Before we get to scoring, I guess I should mention this. The game basically is played over two rounds. So we're going to go until that, style, uh, that stack of nine tiles is exhausted by passing it around, and there's only one tile left, we discard it. Then we're going to grab another stack of nine tiles, and we're going to go the other, other direction. So we have a chance to go each direction one time on passing the tiles. So after that, the game's over, and then we score. Well, I thought scoring was going to be a nightmare. I mean, just look at this. This seems like it would be a nightmare to score right off the bat, right? But this scoring pad is awesome. The scoring pad, I think I think Jamie and the folks at Stonemeyer, uh, maybe BZA, uh, knew that this was going to be one of those things that was hard to score. So they have these score pads that are just great. So you go through and you individually score each of your rooms of that type. So I'm going to go through every food and just score it. Put the numbers in there. And then I, I get a grand total over here and I add them all up and get my score. And really scoring this is just so simple. It's not hard at all. So that's that's uh, roughly how you play this game. Um, I like this game a lot. I will say this. Okay, so here's I'm gonna get more into this in a little bit, but here's my my thoughts right now. Um, I really like this game. I think it's a neat game. The insert makes the game so much quicker to play than other games that require a lot of setup. That would be this kind of a game. Um, so I think that that's a huge plus that you can just throw this on the table with the trays and be playing in a few minutes. So that's really great. Um, I would like I like drafting games fine. Um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite mechanic, but it is a perfectly good mechanic. And this one does drafting probably in a more interesting and cool way than the other games do because you're passing stuff to your teammates, but like at the same time, they're not your teammate. I don't know. It's just weird. Just like you have this weird disequilibrium in your brain on is this person my friend or not like it's going on in this game which is kind of fun to feel um so while you're drafting things you're drafting them to be like what's the best things for now but you don't really want to hate draft either because you know that the person needs to pick something good for your castle as well so it's a pretty quick game it doesn't take a real long time a lot of the the action in this game too happens simultaneously so um I don't think that it's going to scale up with a lot of, of additional playtime as you add more people. And actually, this might be a game where I think as approaching max, this, game's becomes, this game will become better. Um, I just mentioned that because with, with playing with three people at a big table, it's, you kind of have table issues at times where like one person can't see the castle because unless you have like a small round table, it kind of is difficult to play at three. I think when you play with four and five, then you start to be able to spread around the table and have your castles kind of where you can see them all. Um, so there's sometimes table issues with this game a little bit at lower player counts, but it's not a crippling thing that's going to make this game not fun. So, um, I don't know. It's just a really neat game. I really love how these two companies came together and produced this game and, and made this game. The silly theme of the Castles of Mad King, Lud King Ludwig and the art style and the art of like the rooms is really fun. And I think that's a, a more fun thing than, uh, building a city. So like in between two cities. But then I don't, I don't know, the Castles of Mad King Ludwig, that game, I've never played Palaces, if I'm going to be honest, so I don't know exactly how Palaces plays out, but I have played Castles, I do own Castles, and I like that game just fine. But I would say that the mechanics in this game, the like passing the tiles and drafting and all that stuff, I like that better than bidding. And it's also fun, like the, the thing in this game is it's really a fun, silly thing to build this fun, silly, goofy castle. And so doing that with somebody you get twice as many laughs when you do stupid stuff. Like you have like a dungeon and then right above it is like the kitty room. You know what I mean? And then, I mean, just, uh, there's a chocolate fountain that's like in the middle of like the horse stables. I mean, just weird stuff like that that happens in this game is more fun when you're playing it with someone who's doing those weird things with you and making it even more bizarre. So, um, it's a game that you play to win, but it's also a game that you play to have fun just building this weird castle. The other thing too, is I think that this is one of the few games where 
I, I can pop this one out of the box and just look at the tiles. And just, you could spend a minute looking at every tile, just looking at all the little details in it. It's almost like a little, like, Where's Waldo book. And there's, like, little Easter eggs in some of the art, too. So I'll let you guys find those. But the one that's pretty obvious Easter, obvious Easter egg in there is, uh, is on the game room. Check out the game room. Look at the games on the shelf. I think you can probably identify almost all the games on there if you're a fan of, of Stonemaier games, for sure. So, um... At any rate, that's really cool too. The art is just fantastic. So let's just, I guess let's wrap this up. Let's uh, take a look at like my bullet points for what I thought of this game. Um, so first off, the first pro I'm going to say is it's a really cool, unique hybrid of co-op and competitive. I talked about that disequilibrium kind of thing that you have going in your brain when you're playing it. It's like, I want to work with this person, but not, not too much. You know, I mean, I don't know. I guess I do want to work with this person as well as I can. But I don't want them to work with the person on the other side of them very well. So I don't know. It's like it's a weird feeling, honestly. It's unique to this game, honestly. I've I've not been played play between two cities, but I imagine it's the same thing with between two cities. Um, however, I just really like that feeling in this game. Um, it has amazing art. I've mentioned it before. I seriously, this this game would win my favorite art award for this year. I mean, the box cover is just fa fantastically beautiful. The components on the inside are amazing, and then the directions. I don't know if I give the directions enough attention to this, but they're made out of plastic. I mean, like they, they feel like plastic. They feel like if you've ever played Dice Town, the money in Dice Town is out of this like linen plasticky stuff. The directions in this are the same linen plasticky kind of material. It'd be amazing if they start making all their directions out of that because your directions won't get crinkled up. They won't, they'll just hold up and last a lot longer. And I don't know how much that costs to do that for the company, but man, it really does make it nice that those directions, this they the pages flip nicely on it. Um, and it's, it's not paper. You don't have to worry about it tearing. So, um, there's great components, great art. Um, the score pad on this is amazing. That's something that is worth mentioning. This game would be really a bear to score if you had to just kind of figure it out in your head. But the, the score pad is such a great task analysis of just how to score. You score each room individually on its own little box on that score pad. And then you sum it all up on the, on the column there and, and then add it up again. And that's how you get your score. And it, it really isn't hard to score this game. Um, I thought, man, this is just going to be a nightmare to score, but that score pad really makes it super easy. It's amazing. This, this one is one that I don't think people think a lot about, but this one cannot be understated. This game can play seven players. How many games out there do you know that can play seven players and do it well? And this one's going to play seven players well. So, I mean, there's other drafting games like Seven Wonders that can play seven players. There's party games that can play Seven Wonders, but I mean, if you're like me, you're really worn out on a lot of the party games out there. And you're pretty worn out on Seven Wonders. I mean, that was a great game a few years back, and I still like it, but I would way rather play this game. It's new and fresh to me, and it just feels different. It's just, and it's a lot of laughs. I mean, it really is. As you're building these just absurd castles, it's a lot of fun. So it almost gets like the laughs of a party game with actually some uh, strategic thinking and, and things like that. And <laughs> this, whenever you play a game with seven people in it, you're going to have all kinds of gamers in there. So this game is unique enough when with its like it does have tactical stuff of tile laying, but then it has like silliness in it and it has cooperative elements with it. So I mean, this is something that you could really bring to the table um, with like kind of newer players even really because it's fairly easy to describe how to play it and other players who get it better can kind of help the other players along initially. My cons on this, I already mentioned the table issues thing. So if I had a really small little circular table, it would be perfect for playing with three players. And I think it would play really well with three. But the table I have is about like five foot by five foot. And so it's hard to play with three players on a five foot by five foot table because one castle kind of hangs out on its own there and people have to kind of like get up and move and go look at it. Not the end of the world, just an inconvenience and worth mentioning, I think. Um, the other one too is this game is really, I mean, do yourself a favor when you play this game the first time, so let's say you've got a buddy who's got it and you want to check it out before you buy it. If you play this game once, you're going to think it's okay. You're going to think it's fine. But you really need to play it twice, maybe three times before you really make a verdict on it. Because there's so many symbols in this game. There's so many different ways how rooms can interact with each other. But the first time you're playing it, you're really just trying to figure out how can I get some of these, these rooms to score points? You're not worried about bonuses too much. You're not worried about like those three of a kind things that I was talking about, those bonuses. You're not worried about the the um, cards. You're not, I mean, you're just trying to build a cool castle the first time you're doing it. And then as you play more, you start to say, how can I unlock those cards? How can I get those extra tiles, those um, those those towers, those uh, like those like gardens and things like that um, that I can put into my my castle to in order to enhance it and make it even better. So um, I think that it's a short enough game that if you're going to play this game the first time with people, even if you own it, 
I would say, hey, listen, we're going to play this game twice. The first time we're going to play it, we're just going to play it real quick. Just put things down and you need to see how your castle scores and see what scores how and, and understand how to build things. Then we're going to do it again. We're going to shuffle seats up so you have different partners. We're going to put all the tiles back in the box and play again. And then I think you'll really have a good time with it. So um, that's that's my thoughts on it. And it's not even a negative, really. I think that's really probably good practical advice for any shorter game to play it twice. One time just to learn it. Another time just to really get the hang of it. Um, so where am I at with this game? Do I love this game? Is it is it a game that I'm going to reject? I think you can tell from the tone of this so far. I do like it. I'm giving this the board game mechanics accepted seal, uh, which, you know, doesn't matter much yet. Maybe it will someday. But I'm giving this a four and a half out of five wrenches. So um, this means this is a game that I think that 75% of people out there, 70, 75% of people out there who are board game hobbyists would benefit from having this in their collection because... I don't know. I just think it's a unique enough game. It's a fun game. Um, it doesn't take up a ton of shelf space. It's a standard size box, but it's going to get a lot of play when you have certain groups of people. Um, and then you're not going to mind playing it ever. So I just think that really the thing on this, that's the biggest deal. And I don't think I can overstate this. It, it plays seven, like name other games out there that play seven and do it. Well, this one will play seven. Well, and it's not your standard party game or seven wonders. So games that play seven are kind of hard to find. Um, and this one, it does it as well as any of them. So for that reason, it's 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 an extra little bump up. It may even be a 4.51, you know. Um, but it also is a, certainly a rock solid game. Otherwise, I really, really enjoy this game. Um, and I will mention this. This game was offered to us as a promotional consideration uh, to do this review. However, that said, whenever we talk to our publishers, we say we're going to be honest. And they say, oh, we, of course, we expect nothing but honesty from you. Um, so this is an honest review. I always do honest reviews. Um, and I feel like this is, uh, this is a good one. I, I think it's one that you definitely need to go out and try and find a chance to play it, find, get a chance to play it. This one would be excellent, too. Um, Christmas is coming. It'd be a really great Christmas game to, to bring to Christmas and get a bunch of cousins and grandma all together to play this game. So that's it, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this, we're going to have some tiles popping up here where you can subscribe or you can find a video that you might enjoy. That's by us. Um, we love it when you support us. Also, you can check out bgmechanics.com to find our podcast where we have an interview with Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games. Um, really great guy. So supporting that company is, uh, is something I, I think is really cool too. So anyway, uh, that's been it. Keep gaming. And I've been Joel.